Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. Uh, yet another edition of the hottest podcast in podcasting. Uh, I believe that's, it's aptly named. Yeah, it is aptly named, that's for sure. It may not be the hottest, but it's aptly named. Should be the hottest in the aptly named aspect. There so there, we've got that going for us, right? Awesome. That was awesome. You know, and Ms. Austin Ward uh, chiming in. Awesome, Ward. He's not my sidekick. He's my co-pilot, man. I, you know, if I ever felt uh, rough air uh, on approach or whatever, I would definitely let him land this thing. Uh, awesome. Welcome once again to the Tim May Podcast. Or an exploding engine. I mean, oh. Dude, that's when I would take over. That's when I would, <laughs> I, you know, I would love to have been Captain Sully. I mean, I would have loved to have been Captain Sully. I don't know how many times on Flight Simulator I've done that exact same thing. Except really? Always trying to find some place uh, dry to land. But, uh Man, I'm telling you, as long as you got one good working engine, you can still make it far these days, brother. <laughs> That's not for me. I I couldn't even ride in a plane if that happened. I I might be done forever. I'll tell you what, though, man. That's when you find out who definitely is agnostic or an atheist and who isn't. You know, it's <laughs> moments like those. Agreed? When you're looking out the window and you see the fire and the flames of an engine barely operating, when you can see the guts of a turbine engine, you know things have gone a little too far. Yeah, that's uh, even just seeing the news pictures from that most recent example uh, it makes me nervous. Uh, yeah. It's not for me. You know, as I remind people, uh, you know, many times, I'm not afraid to fly. I've, I've soloed an airplane when I was on my 16th birthday when I was 16 years old and uh, flew quite a bit back then. and. Uh, but, uh, you know, the more, ch it's kind of like rolling the dice, you know, the more chances you got, the more chances you take, the more chances you got to roll in snake eyes. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> that's kind of the, but that's the way it is when you drive a car, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, it was an interesting development over the weekend. Washington United, I think it was United Airlines flight. Had to come back on one engine and land safely, by the way, not only land safely, we, we had a greaser of a landing. Uh, that just shows you the, the skill of these pilots these days. Uh, they can, as long as there's still some, some power going on and all the wings are still attached, you can still land these things, right? That, that is reassuring, yeah, indeed. Yeah, you still want to land uh, in Wyoming. That's the way I look at it. But, hey, that's another, that's another podcast for another day. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my, my co-pilot, uh, Awesome Ward, is from Wyoming. But uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Awesome, I got a good – I think I've got a pretty good podcast today. I say that every time. But, you know, this is one of my favorite guests I've had on a couple of times, uh, Paul Feinbaum the mouth of the South, you know, and, uh, ESPN fame and his radio show is a, it's a, you know, it's four hours a day and, uh, it's just nonstop calls, et cetera. And he never is shy to give an opinion. I'm going to get to him in just a second, but, uh, you know, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about a couple of other developments over the weekend. Speaking of cowlings of engines coming off and people wondering whether they're that's safe to fly, et cetera. You know, we're going to talk about maybe some of the denigration for one of another term, uh, Justin Fields is sort of going through right now in the uh, in the draft process or the uh, assessing for the draft process. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think t people are going to believe that we scripted this whole intro, Tim. Like you yeah. improv everything there about the planes. We did not talk about that. I just want to make it clear. That's why this is that hottest aptly named podcast. We didn't talk about any of that plane stuff. That's all, that's all Tim May. You can only get that here. Well, you know what, if I had another podcast to do, I would do something on aviation and then I would do, I would do if I could get enough of an audience, something on auto racing, because to me, they're one in the same in a lot of respects. And I've always loved the engineering of stuff more than I have the personalities involved. But you know what, on a podcast, you got to have personalities. And hey, what better personality to talk to you to get an opinion, whether you like it or not, than Paul Feinbaum. And, uh, you know, he has some interesting opinions, pro and con about a lot of things that uh, especially Ohio State fans hold dear. So without further ado, let's get to that interview. And as promised, ladies and gentlemen, here's Paul Feinbaum of the, the Mouth of the South, uh, the Mouth that Roared. Uh, Paul Feinbaum, welcome again to the Tim May Podcast. Tim, uh, it is uh, my pleasure, and I apologize for uh, Jim Harbaugh barking downstairs, uh, but uh, he, was, he was all excited because Michigan finally beat Ohio State in something. Hey, I was going to say he's making some noise, man. I think uh, I think all Michigan fans are glad to hear him making some noise. Hey, I want to get right into it, man. You can have dogs in the background. You can have dancing girls. I don't care what's going on behind you there. Uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, real quick uh, about a bunch of things, but but in rapid-fire succession, um, rapid-fire fashion, 
number one, you had pretty much a, a pretty good take on Urban Meyer uh, last week on your show and stuff. And I just wanted to get into it. I mean, do you uh, do you think that was just a, a stumbling, a, a little stumble he took in hiring the uh, the former weight coach, uh, strength coach from Iowa? But uh, how do you think he will do as a head coach? What's just what's your take at this point in the uh, Urban Meyer moving to the NFL? Well, Tim, I do think he's a smart guy. So um, you know, one would one would hope or, or at least think he'd learn from that. But but I, I think for uh, your audience, uh, who knows Urban very well, uh, it should not have been a surprise. Urban Meyer beats to his own drummer. He has no concern over uh, what you think is right or, or moral or what I think. Uh, he does what he believes. And, you know, we saw that a couple of summers ago in Zach Smith. And I, th- I think it was just a, it was a ridiculous mistake that should have been avoided, but you know, no one's around Urban, uh, has ever been around Urban saying, hey, Urban, uh, let's, let's talk about this. I mean, I know you're trying to save the world and rehabilitate somebody who probably uh, isn't ready to be rehabilitated. So it was a mistake, but I think the good, the good news is it happened so quickly and before he had to deal with a locker room that I, I'm hoping he deals with it first day that uh, of OTAs and it's over. Uh, and, and then he could move on to, uh, you know, being another NFL coach, one of many. Yeah. You know, I, I've known him for a while, for quite a while, as a matter of fact, and I know his, I, I could see his thinking in that whole thing that nobody does more research on this guy than I did. You know what I mean? And that he could, he could see that uh, he thinks the guy, like you said, has rehabilitation in him, but uh, sometimes uh, your past follows you way too quickly and uh, you have to move on. I'm talking about, you know, in regards to that coach, but uh, just real quick, were you, uh, I, want, I haven't talked to you since, since he got hired at Jacksonville. Do you, do you think he will succeed there? I mean, like you just pointed out, uh, I think he's just, you know, more than anything else, I think he's a really smart guy. He does his homework. He knows usually what buttons to push. Just, But that transition, college to pro, is tough for a lot of guys. We saw Nick Saban not do well in that regard, you know, because one thing, you're taking orders from somebody. <laughs> you know, these guys aren't used to, like, maybe uh, taking orders, et cetera. How do you think Urban will do in that regard? The, the table is set for him, first pick. Uh, best cap space you've ever seen, et cetera. Just what's your take on it? I don't think he'll succeed. And and I don't think he'll succeed for some pretty obvious reasons, Tim. He can't lose. Uh, This guy is is the worst loser I've ever seen. And he will lose uh, eight or nine or 10 or 11 times or more the first year. And I think it will eat him up. And we'll start to see some of the the tendencies that we've seen at Florida and Ohio State. Now, I I think it's entirely possible that he'll, he'll have some success at some point, but is it sustainable? And that's the hard part about the NFL. Yeah. Uh, you know, he could get to the playoffs his second or third year. Uh, and then, you know, the next year it's, a, it's, you know, this quarterback gets hurt and it's a disaster. And, and Urban Meyer doesn't deal with disaster well. And, you know, I, I thought his run, I said this a lot of times, I know you're, you know, our Buckeye fans came after me, but I, I thought he underachieved at Ohio State, Tim. I, I, I mean, one, one lousy national championship with all that talent. Uh, I mean, Nick Saban, you know, gets blistered for, for going two seasons without winning a national title. And, uh, and, and Urban had uh, – Urban left a lot of titles on the ground. And, you know, not to you know, dig up all bones here, but uh, it was criminal that he didn't win it in 2015. And, you know, there was another time or two that he probably should have. And – and that's in college. Uh, you know, he's up against more competition in the pros. And when you get right down to it at Ohio State, he had to, uh, he had to navigate a tough non-conference game every year. And the Buckeyes played the big game. Uh, we all know that. And then, uh, you know, he had to you know, deal with, you know, maybe a hot team somewhere. Was it, whether it's, you know, Penn State uh, on, a, on a whiteout or that, you know, that, that every five or six years that Jim Harbaugh put a uh, legitimate team on the field. Uh, yeah. But, you know, when, when Jim Harbaugh is your – when your biggest rival is Jim Harbaugh, it's like stealing from kids. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like stealing candy from a kid, but it's not really very difficult. And then, you know, navigate, you know, avoid the upset in, in a conference championship game. And he did that, you know, I think all except one time maybe. Uh, and then, you know, fight to get back in the playoff after you have done your traditional – uh, and an annual lose on the road to somebody by four touchdowns that should you should have never lost to, and you know that that's Urban Meyer's resume. It's a, it's a great resume if you're anywhere but Alabama, Ohio, or Ohio State. But uh, I, I thought he underachieved there, and I think he'll do the same thing here because 
Yeah, he's up against 31 geniuses across the board. Everybody's got the same system. There's nothing new in the NFL. There, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, go stockpile players. Uh, you can't go into Florida and get a great kid to come to Ohio State because of tradition. You can't get a legend uh, who played, whose dad played at Ohio State. And even though he's starting ahead with, with Trevor Lawrence and some other picks, uh, I think the train will run out of gas eventually. It always does with Urban. Yeah. Oh, I would defend him on a lot of those counts that you just threw out there, but it would take too long on my show. Yeah, but, uh, that's why, that's why I, 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 told, is, I went on so long. Yeah, no, no, but no. But I, the <laughs> one thing I say was, it, at least when he was there, Ohio State was in the hunt every year. You know, you can't Absolutely. say that about most major programs. And number two, you're right. I think the 2015 team, they had a shot to repeat. They had that one loss to Michigan State, but otherwise – that was a hell of a football team. They might have right. won the first two college football playoff team, but they didn't get invited for whatever stupid reason, you know. And uh, and it is what it is, you know. But uh, but you're right. Here's here's one thing I'll say about her before we move on. I think he's smart enough to know the difference between the colleges and the pros. Yeah, losing eats him up without a doubt. But he's smart enough to know, you know, in college football, you lose once and you're pretty much you're out of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the NFL, you can go ten and six and make the playoffs and. Uh, I think he's smart enough to understand that, but you're right. As this thing goes on, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, and Tim, we'll one more to- thing. Uh, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't, you know, the criticism in college football is pretty tame. Um, yeah. You know, a guy like you may take a shot, uh, you know, somebody on ESPN may take a shot, but the, you know, for, and I had somebody argue with me, well, you know, Jacksonville's not that tough a market. That's Jacksonville's not the market that will get urban Meyer. It's every morning on ESPN. Yeah. It's on, it's on, uh, you know, Fox. Uh, I mean, there are so many, the NFL network, there are so many tributaries talking about the NFL 52 weeks out of the year. And, you know, I, I've, I've been in those studios uh, in New York for, for the ESPN shows. And, you know, those guys are, you know, m- you know, those guys are pretty uh, relentless and, and, yeah. and they, they take no prisoners and urban Meyer has a big bullseye on his back. Yeah, I, you're right. I mean, that's, you know, if he listens to all that, then, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't belong there in the first place. Well, somebody, you know? I, I know his wife will listen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, 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 uh, the, the people close to you always listen to it. You know, that brings me to the great segue I wanted to talk to you about. You know, we all along, you know, you talk about moving from the, uh, from college to, to pro football by coaches, et cetera. Only a few of them have ever done it successfully. Jimmy Johnson's one of those guys, et cetera. But to the interesting thing to me, uh, as long as I've been alive, which is about 10 years longer than you have, I think, is that – but you know what I'm saying there, Paul, where I wanted to go with you here. Programs, these big-time programs that uh, are on the riding, – riding high right now, uh, you know, we've seen Alabama after Bear Bryant before they finally found Gene Stallings, you know what I mean? And then after Gene Stallings before they finally found Nick Saban. Uh, uh, why is it so tough, do you think, for these programs – to follow because Nick Saban is getting up in years. Who knows? He may coach another 15 years. Who knows? But uh, what, why is it so tough, you know, for these programs to, to continue that, that greatness uh, for one of another term? Well, I think you, Tim, the, one of the hardest things in, in, in all of mankind is, is, is picking the right person. And yeah. you, know, you could go to, you could go from, you know, your spouse to uh, a yeah. football coach to a, a CEO. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, it may be under a 50, 50 proposition. So, so I think that's a, a applicable in, in coaching as well. And I mean, just look, you know, look at, uh, you mentioned all the names at, at, uh, at Alabama, look at Ohio state. It's, uh, yeah. you know, one of the three greatest traditions in college football history. And, you know, post Woody Hayes, it, it was a roller coaster, Nebraska. Uh, even when you think you got it right, you got it wrong. And I think that was that's been the problem at Alabama as well. And another thing, you know, that that when they hired Nick Saban, uh, they were fortunate. He wanted out of the NFL. He was not fired at uh, after two years in Miami. Wayne right. Huizinga, the owner, they really did not want him to leave. You know, would he have been successful there ultimately? I'm not really sure. I, I probably would have bet against it. But he walked into Alabama. Uh, he had he had clout. He had gravitas, and he basically told the boosters and the media to get the blank out of his way. I mean, he did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, had med- he had meetings with the media, and he, th- he threatened them. He said, uh, I, will, I, will, I will treat you fairly, but if you ever cross me, if you ever lie, if you mislead, if you print something or publish something or broadcast something that I've told you is off the record, you're done. You'll, and, I mean, those, those guys came out of those meetings scared to death. 
I mean, I don't, you know, I don't need to explain to you the, the modern media of, of yeah. uh, 2021 or even, even back then it was 2008. And, and I, I think uh, very few people have that power or, or, or can execute it. Yeah. I mean, finding that right guy, it seems like it'd be a snap, you know, but uh, tradition only carries you so far. <laughs> I mean, it's, right. it's really, and you, and a lot of these guys back, a lot of these programs back into guys, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, Jim Trussell was a second or third pick for Ohio State way back when, you know, uh, Urban, of course, was sitting there like a uh, low hanging fruit and uh, uh, Gene Smith was able to to grab it. But, uh, but you're exactly right. I mean, you know, it's, it, that's what I want to get to you. I mean, I grew up in Alabama and then Texas, you know, has Texas made the right hire, do you think, to finally get back to the promised land? Steve Sarkeesian. I mean, what's your take? I think they're better than they were. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not about to tell you that he is uh, he's the answer because, I, I frankly, I thought Tom Herman was. I, I yeah. really thought he was – I mean, you guys uh, know Tom Herman. I thought he was a great coach. And, you know, that, that, uh, that environment just finally uh, ate him up. I, I think they were smart to make a change, which I'll, I'll give them credit in spite of all their lies and – and misleading uh, comments, uh, they, they got somebody. And I think, I think he, was, he was the hottest coach out there. But, uh, you know, I think Texas is, is, is on the brink of maybe becoming an, another Nebraska and, and, and Michigan. You know, those, those great traditional programs that just can't get it right. Yeah. It's interesting to me, though. I mean, I, but you know, it, sounds like an, it sounds like you just walk in there and flip a button and, boom, you're going to win. But, you know, tech, you know Jimbo Fisher sitting – a hundred miles away, you know right. what I mean? At Texas A&M, exactly. et cetera. Exactly. And he's in another league. He's in the league, you know, according to a lot of people, I mean, the SEC and uh, I mean, the competition there is crazy. Alabama, I mean, Ohio state recruits down there, cherry picks guys, Alabama, et cetera. It's tough. You know, I wanted to ask you that, you know, in that regard, uh, uh, who do you, who do you see as the next, I mean, from your, from your vantage point, who is that next uh, great coach in the SEC? Uh, some guys have kind of come and gone a little bit. Some guys you're kind of wondering about, like Kirby Smart, et cetera. Is Dan Mullen, I mean, you know, uh, he had the one of the weirdest years, one of the weirdest seasons I've ever seen in Florida from really grabbing people by the throat to what are you doing at the end of the year and stuff. But uh, take Saban out of the mix. Who is that next great coach down there, do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm going to give you some obvious names and then we'll get under the surface. Uh, I don't think there's any question the two coaches after Saban are Kirby Smart and Jimbo Fisher. And I, I, there, there's no surprise in those answers, but yeah. uh, but I'll move to Dan Mullen for a second. I don't think he is. Uh, Dan Mullen showed, showed a lot this year that he, he may not be long for, for Florida. You, you, can, you can almost feel that he's looking around, whether it's the NFL or, or something huh. else. Yeah. Um, after that, uh, you know, you have a couple of wild cards. I really like uh, Eli Drinkwitz at, at Missouri. Just a cool customer. I think he could become a big coach somewhere else. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, Kiffin is, is an enigma. Uh, I, I think it's entirely possible he could break out there. But, you know, you know he's a little bit in that Sarkeesian mode. You're not really sure. He, it depends on the fit. But uh, I would probably, uh, yeah. I also tell you another guy. I don't know if he'll he'll make it huge at at Vanderbilt, but but Clark Lee, who came down from Notre Dame, to me has been very impressive. You know, brilliant defensive guy. Uh, there was talk about uh, you know three four years away from maybe him taking over for Brian Kelly at Ohio State. So those are some uh, some strange names, but uh, that's who I would, I would go with. Hey, real quick, uh, Ryan Day. What do you think he's done his first two years? Has he replaced Urban? With a plum, how would you describe it? They finally beat Clemson, <laughs> yeah, well. uh, and then it got got beat by one of the great Alabama teams I've ever seen. Maybe the, considering the circumstances, maybe the best Alabama team I've ever seen. But uh, uh, just in, in number two, past past Ryan Day, I don't know where you would put him on the ranks in the Big Ten. I, who else just catches your eye in the Big Ten? You think uh, can get it going on? Well, your audience uh, knows what I'm going to say here because I, I think I, I said this before Ryan Day ever coached the game here, uh, Tim. I, I've always liked him. Uh, I thought that was, you know, as seamless a, a transition as, as I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, he's proven that. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, you know, short of, short of the, the Silver Cup, uh, I don't know what else he could do. Uh, I mean, he has had two brilliant years. And uh, especially this year, you know, overcoming all the noise. Um, I think he, he is, uh, you know, I, I think the only concern about Ryan Day is you know, will, will some NFL club come, come and take him away? 
Uh, he, he looks prime for at least that possibility. You know, beyond that in the Big Ten, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an unusual league because, uh, you know, I mean, you, you've had com- some comments like P.J. Fleck, who you thought were sure things, and n- now you're not so sure. Scott Frost, I, I'll never forget Tim Brando was on our show as Scott Frost was being hired, and he, he, he pretty much guaranteed a couple of national championships. How about yeah. a winning record? I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know what the, what, the, what the answer there is. I mean, Franklin, to me, uh, I mean, he's certainly a good coach. Tennessee tried to hire him, uh, but, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to make him a Hall of Fame coach. I, I frankly like Shiano. Uh, I, I think he, uh, he is sneaky good uh, at, at Rutgers. And, you know, Loxley, I think, uh, has a chance uh, at Maryland. And, you know, I, I, yeah. yeah, he can't. Yeah, you know, Mel Tucker, I think, is another guy that uh, I've known him a while when he was at Alabama and Georgia. And I think I, he's somebody I'm keeping my eyes on. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, – I think Ryan Day is the best coach in the Big Ten. Uh, and, you know, and frankly, I'm, I'm not sure who, who could make a claim to be better. Yeah, you and I both know what makes you a great coach is the players you recruit, you know, and the exactly. coaches you recruit. And uh, Ohio State keeps stacking them up, you know, from uh, in both sides, but definitely in the player side. Of Tim, it. he replaced he replaced the second best coach in college football, and yeah. you wouldn't know it. I mean, there's yeah. almost there's no drop off. Yeah, that's in, what in I was fact, talking I about. I might argue I might argue the program's better with yeah. uh, Ryan Day than than uh, than Urban Meyer. Wow, there's that's less drama. But that's what I was talking about a while ago about those transitions when you go from one coach to the other. You know, there who knows what the right you 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 can you know teams have teams have elevated guys before and fallen flat on their face. You know what I mean? You never know what's really going to work, do you? Until it until five years later. No, you. But uh, yeah, I mean, you could argue. Oh well, he had a great he he he, he, he walked into a great situation. He did, but but he didn't make it worse. He's yeah. You know the the argument why I think it's a little bit better is that. You know, the drama I mentioned, uh, and there wasn't always a lot of drama with Ohio State, but, you know, there was that inexplicable loss, which we have not seen yet. Yeah, good point. Last thing, who have you got your eye on this coming season already that you think, I'm talking about a program, a a team that could make a rise that uh, maybe has been dormant for a while or has been laying in the weeds, whatever. Who who just intrigues you right now in uh, late February? Uh, because college football fans, it's a hot stove league for them, uh, 24-7, you know? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a very traditional answer, but uh, the team, I, uh, because they've been in the playoffs every year, but almost every year, but I think Oklahoma has a chance to win it all next year because of their quarterback. Um, that is certainly not a dormant team. Uh, no. In terms of, a, of a, you know, to me, the, the teams that are, that are obvious, but, uh, you know, keep your eyes on, uh, or Oklahoma and, and Georgia because uh, Georgia has it all this year. Now, now you're looking for someone under the surface a little bit that, that could make a run. Um, I, I'm not sure that's possible anymore in college football, Tim. Uh, I, I yeah. think it's extremely tough to make that next step. I mean, Texas A&M nearly did it this year from an average team to uh, you know, a team that was, that was legitimately a top four team at the end. But but, uh, you know, the, yeah. the, the teams that, that you know, that, that seven or eight teams that we see every year have almost blocked out the rest of college football. I yeah. mean, you're going to see it. You, you may see a team that uh, has an unusually good season. But, uh, you know, the question, yeah, I mean, USC uh, might be one I would I would I would opt for. Uh, it's a traditional name, but they have not been good lately. I mean, they seem to be getting better, uh, yeah, although it's hard to trust them out there. Hey, Paul, real quick before you go, I mean, I know this is my last question, but I always have three follows, but I would just want to ask you this. Is, is Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and maybe Oklahoma, I'd throw Oklahoma into that bunch. Is that good for college football? You know what I'm talking about, the continual? Yeah. Uh, or is that, uh, you know, Ohio State's a national name. Alabama's a national name. Uh, you could make the argument for the other two, uh, definitely, but uh, – is that good for college football, or will, will, how would you? What's your take on? Because a lot of people are arguing that's it's not good to have those traditional powers always in the mix. I would argue that it's not good for college football because I think we saw this year, and, and this was an outlier year because of COVID. But yes. that, you know, the ratings really were uh, were, were extremely weak, and yeah. you know, with Ohio State and, and Alabama, it should have been a record rating. But we, we did. I mean, it was the rating for the championship game, as you know, Tim, was worse than the uh, the playoffs. College, yeah. college football is, is seriously flawed. 
So I, I think that's more of the issue than, you know, who the teams are. Yeah, it would be exciting to, to see a new team in there. Uh, that, you know, maybe, you know, that, you know, with some sensational player on his way to the Heisman that we, we haven't seen before. But, but I think ultimately uh, you cannot come up with a better four than we had. I mean, you had, you had Alabama and Notre Dame, uh, yeah. probably the two biggest names in college football history. You had Ohio State would be in the top four or five in college football history. And then Clemson, which has been one of the two best programs of the last decade. So I, I don't even know how you could top that uh, other than yeah. maybe Southern Cal. Um, you know, being in there uh, instead of Clemson. But, but I, I don't think it would have mattered. Uh, I, I just think people uh, don't like the system. Uh, the season seems to peak on January 1st, and then the playoff championship game completely gets lost. You, you got, you, you've lived through that a couple of times, and you're, you're fighting the NFL. Uh, you have, this year we had uh, six NFL games on the Saturday and Sunday before – the national championship game. And by the time we got to Monday morning, folks were tired. I mean, they go, okay, oh, there's a game tonight. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not talking about Columbus and Birmingham. I'm talking about in LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, the awareness of the championship game was very low. But even the Super Bowl ratings were down, right? I mean, was, right. was not a super, what, do you think it's just, what, what do you, what do you attribute that to Paul? I mean, it was it ju- just the pandemic uh, malaise of what, what, what do you think's going on here? Is football on well, the way? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I mean, NFL, I mean, television experts will say the game matters, but but I, I think the, I've watched a lot of blowout games yeah. when the, the number was still significantly higher. Uh, the Super Bowl was clearly affected by the by the by the uh, by by the game. But but the bottom line, Tim, is this. I mean, talk to your children, your grandchildren. They're not watching conventional television anymore. Yeah. And I mean, they're, they're, I mean, we all, every, every, every person, uh, you know, who has to deal with young people, I don't mean that it's like, like it's, it's a chore. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, they're, yeah. their hands on, their hands on their phone uh, yeah. and they're watching stuff and, you know, they'll look up of oh, oh, the game. I mean, I, I run into people uh, when I traveled every, every, you know, four or five times a week and, I don't know. For some reason, young young kids just couldn't couldn't wait to tell me. I I you know, I see you, but I never see you on television. It's just like you know, I don't want to be caught dead watching that big, seventy two inch thing. Uh, it's not it's not really cool. And, and yeah. I think that ultimately, uh, you may see some tune in early, and then this game's no good. I'm I'm going to flip over to Netflix and see what the latest rage is. I think you're exactly. I think you hit the nail right on the head. There are all kinds. It's like it's like uh, it's like uh, you know what they talk about pro football in Southern California or Miami. You know there are other things to do. You know mm-hmm. than go to the game. So uh, and there are other things to watch. Like let's dig eighteen. I started watching that. It's a guy that runs a backhoe. You know and uh, but it's like watching a guy run, run a zamboni machine. Well, you kind of get. Well, fixed I don't want to be. I don't want to be negative because I spent most of my life in one of these two places. But you know the. the College football's two best markets are Columbus, Ohio, and Birmingham, Alabama. And yeah, yeah I can tell you in Birmingham there is nothing else to do. Columbus has a has a you know has a has a hockey team at least, yeah. um, but there's not much else to do other than uh, pay attention to the local team. Yeah, plus plus uh, Columbus has the reigning ma- major league soccer champion. So there you go. I'm, I I was about to mention that, but I couldn't. Uh, but it slipped my mind. Like it slipped uh, your mind. Yeah. Hey, Paul Feinbaum, always a pleasure, my man. I, lo- I love coming on your show too, man, whenever you need me. But thanks for coming back on the Tim May Podcast, my man. Tim, it's my, it's uh, it's one of the things I look forward to. I'm just glad you remember me uh, now that you're you know, playing golf uh, seven times Three, four, a week. Seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Feinbaum, the incomparable mouth of the South. Well, Paul Feinbaum tells it like it is, or he tells it like he sees it. Uh, awesome. You, you got to give it up to him on that. But uh the idea that uh, Urban Meyer, he doesn't see him succeeding in Jacksonville, you know, down the road. I mean, as this thing par- plays out, uh, sees that uh, the uh, pain and suffering of losing a football game or losing a bunch of football games may be too much for him. I don't know. What's your take on just that? And, and what's your take on, on Urban Meyer and his chances of succeeding at the next level? I'm not uh, gung-ho crazy about it. That I think that this is going to be – the easiest transition in the world for him. I don't, I don't think it will be. I think there's a little bit of an element in um, the national media and some people that have, you know, had interactions with with Urban Meyer that were much further in the past than what we did recently when he was at Ohio State with him. Yeah. That think, well, there's there's just no way that it could work. That you know he he's too tortured by the losing. 
recruiting is what he said well, or pro players won't listen to him. He can't control them that way. And I don't, I don't think any of that is, is uh, unfair or out of bounds. That's not, not, not the way I'm coming at it. I have some of those same questions about how it will work, but um, I've also found that betting against Urban Meyer is not usually uh, the smartest thing to do with your money um, or, or your take or whatever. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm more curious about it than I am skeptical. I, I yeah. if that makes sense. I, I don't know if it will or won't, you know, I think he's going to have to change and I think he has changed. He's evolved at every stop that he's been at, in my opinion. Now, I remember yes. you said, you said where I was from early on in the podcast. I mean, he was at Utah when I was, uh, just starting out, you know, covering college football and in, in college at Wyoming, watch those teams and, and Alex Smith, you know, what, what he had to do there was different than Bowling Green. What he had to do at Florida was different than Utah. What he had to do here was different than what he did at Florida. So it's not as if he's only ever done things one way. The Urban Meyer way doesn't have a ton of flexibility to it, but <clears throat> he thought about this long and hard and what it was going to take. Yes. Uh, and that he can't do it by himself. You know, I think, you know, he's had one – misstep already that you know they seem to uh recognize and rectify in a hurry um you know that maybe you know is going to take a little bit of a, all these things about the nfl are new to him they and they are going to require adjustments but he's he's nothing if not uh a relentless worker and constantly trying to succeed like i don't i guess when i think about this and i'll, I'll stop rambling and, and digressing like steve spurrier like when that didn't connect right away I understand why he's like, all right, well, that's, I gave it a shot. My way doesn't work. I'm going to take it back to college. But Urban has no desire to go back to college. He, yeah. I, I really believe that he will do whatever it takes to succeed and give it his best shot here. You know, I, I never know what NFL coach is going to connect. You know, that's not really my yeah, – They don't need ball. I'd, I'd make yeah. a lot of money off that. But, but <laughs> my point is betting against him is not usually a good idea. Yeah, just think about it. all all of the guys who have hired head coaches in the, in the NFL over the over the years who have been really wrong, you know. But they didn't know it when they hired. Just look at the Cleveland Browns as a <laughs> microcosm of you have no idea who's going to be the guy, you know, and you have no idea who's going to be the guy, and he's going to walk into a situation that's tailor made for him from a talent standpoint and everything else. And I'm not talking about just players, but coaches, et cetera. Uh, the great thing, like I like I pointed out again to Paul, and I've pointed out with you and I talking about it, is Urban Meyer has a chance to build this program pretty much from a coaching standpoint, definitely, and from a player standpoint, uh, definitely, with the the ridiculous uh, salary uh, cap room that he's got, mm -hmm. and to be be able to drive to draft the quarterback of your dreams, which look more and more is looking like Trevor Lawrence is going to be that guy. Uh, he has a he has a chance to build a program exactly the way he wants it. And, uh, and I think he sees that. He saw this as the greatest opportunity in pro football as opposed to the Houston Texans and some of these other places you're going to go, go into, which would have been have built-in problems right off the bat, you know. And, uh, yeah, he made <clears> – <throat> as I pointed out to Paul when he criticized that hiring, you know, the, the former strength coach from, from Iowa, you know, what I know about Urban Meyer is Urban Meyer did his homework on this guy thought he was definitely recyclable for one of another term. But, you know, it doesn't mean everybody else is going to see it your way. And as we found out in the NFL, NFL is as much PR as it is anything else. And the PR was such that they couldn't hang on to this fellow, even though I'm sure Urban uh, saw him as bringing exactly what he wanted to that, to that weight room, uh, working, I think, probably under Anthony Schlegel. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but it was gonna that was gonna be an interesting mix too because those are two people Urban Meyer and Anthony Schlegel who aren't afraid to tell you like it is as you well know from your having him <laughs> on the on the yeah. Roosters uh, noon show uh, all the all this many times all those many times uh, but uh, but the bottom line is I think Urban is smart enough to know you don't have to win every game as I've touched on in our podcast before you know in the, in college football you lose one game and you're pretty much out of the running for the national championship. The NFL, you can lose six and still win the Super Bowl, you know, just so you don't lose any in, once the playoffs start. So, uh, you know, I, I'm my jury is out on Urban. I lean more toward him being a success 
uh, just, just, just because I know how much he studied about it. I know how much he wants it. I know he's smart enough to understand that you're going to lose some games, but he doesn't want to lose a lot. Uh, if he loses a lot, that's when I'd really have the, uh, uh, that's when I'd really have the vehicles parked outside. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Agree. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, look, when you talk about salary cap room and Trevor Lawrence, like, that doesn't mean that you can instantly turn around in one year. I would be surprised if they did. And it's not fair to either Urban Meyer or Trevor Lawrence or whoever else they pick as their quarterback in order to place that expectation on them. Um, yeah. You know, it is possible in a year or two to turn around an NFL franchise. Um, now, but if we're talking about one and 15 or two and 14, um, that's when I get into a little bit of, well, are you sure you don't want to be on big noon kickoff and, you know, taking some trips out to wine country and relaxing at the lake. That's, that's when I start and playing Muirfield. That's when I start wondering that if it gets to that point. And I, and look, I don't know. I, I don't know everyone who's on Jacksonville's roster now, you know, I don't know how they'll use that cap space. Uh, you know, that's just not my expertise. Um, yeah. I know the guy who's in charge there now. Um, and I, that would be my, my concern is if, he doesn't see that progress happening in year one, you know, how that resonates. I know that's kind of hard to square with what I said before with him being committed and chasing, you know, that excellence and not being Steve Spurrier and just first sign of trouble taking that, you know, program back. Like the thing with him is that he's got no desire to recruit again or to have a job that really puts you under that strain 365 days a year. He believes that the NFL is not that way. So Maybe he'll be a little bit more patient with that. But, you know, like you said, that will be the thing where we have to see it to believe it. But maybe he'll – maybe they'll have such a great, great instant impact and we won't have to worry about it. In terms of college football, he's as, he's as successful as any man has ever been in college football coaching. I'm talking about just from a win percentage. Uh, you know, Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney, uh, at least at one school, Dabo Sweeney, has, ex has exceeded him. But, uh, but bottom line is when he left college football, he was co um, among contemporaries. He was the elite. Uh, he's 56 years old. Maybe you don't want to try this when you're 66 or 67, although Bruce Arians has done a pretty good job. <laughs> and uh, we're going to get the reason why Bruce Arians has done a pretty good job, the linchpin that finally put uh, Tampa Bay back over the top again. But the bottom line, if you're going to try this, try it, try it still when you're a reasonably young man and 56 is a young man. He's had two years to get to to get himself uh, squared away from a physical standpoint. Perhaps he's uh he's be able to better control that arachnoidal, arachnoidal cyst better than he was uh, several years ago. We'll see how that goes, just from a physical standpoint. And uh, I would never describe Urban Meyer as mellow. You wouldn't either. From the uh, I don't think from the uh, just the negotiations y'all went through uh, getting. Uh, getting that show at the Urban Meyer Pint House, you know how much he, whenever he's involved in something, he's involved it, in it up to his hips. He should wear hip waders uh, when he's doing any kind of work. Maybe even those kind that come all the way up to your chest there when you're fly fishing in Wyoming, it's, uh, trying to tie you back in. I mean, he's going to be up to it, uh, to your, you know, to the breastplate. Let's put it that way. I mean, uh, I would say he is the definition of up to your eyeballs and in anything. I mean, that's – yeah. Yeah, so maybe you should wear a hazmat suit when he's working. Yeah, good's not good enough. Great's, yeah. great's getting closer. But uh, the bottom line is he's going to give it his best shot, whatever that shot is. It, you know, like I told Paul Feinbaum, we're gonna, we'll be sitting there four or five years from now and judging just to, exactly what that was. But we all know that to get to the promised land in, in pro football, just like really in college football, but at a, at a more elite level, uh, different level for this position, uh, you got to have that quarterback. We all know that Trevor Lawrence is the apple of Urban Meyer's eye right now. I don't think he's left any debate about that. Uh, being front and center, Trevor Lawrence's workout, which brings me to uh, what I talked about earlier. I prefaced with uh, before the Paul Feinbaum interview. Justin Fields, man, has left Ohio State for the NFL. Uh, that's pretty much irrevocable at this point, the way I understand it, right? Yep. And uh, uh, and boy, the more the more assessments you see of him and his abilities and where he's got to go, the more people seem to be squinting a little bit. Uh, as in, well, I don't know, is this, 
is this that guy, you know, <laughs> and uh, meaning is he, is he tailor made ready to pull right out of the box and lead you to the promised land? Uh, I'm not surprised by these assessments. Neither are you, are you? This is that season. Uh, it's that time of year where the microscopes come out and uh, flaws get magnified. And uh, Trevor Lawrence seems to be the only one who's immune to that right now. Um, and then these drafts, these experts, the scouts, the general managers are trying to find new ways to, to fall in love with somebody who might not have accomplished anything nearly to the level that Justin Fields has. Um, I mean, the fact that they're going to focus on a couple games against ranked opponents or you know, the worst games of his career instead of what he did at his absolute best or how frequently he did it against very good teams or the sample size when he was hurt at the end of the 2019 season, I'll never really understand it, um, especially trying to talk yourself out of Justin Fields uh, if that's what's really happening and that none of this is that, you know, February, March, April smoke screen. I mean, wait a minute, wait a minute. Talk yourself out of Justin Fields for what? Yeah, for that's the question, you know, or somebody playing um, an independent schedule for somebody who took an entire year away from football, didn't have more film uh, out there for yeah. somebody who was throwing to the most talented offense uh, of skill, playing for the most talented offense in the country, uh, didn't have to do a ton. I mean, that's fine. I don't, whatever people want, that's their business. But if you're, if you're looking for flaws because you, you'd rather try something new or you think you're going to discover something in Zach Wilson that uh, you're not like, what, what does Justin Fields have to show you? I'm not yeah. sure what is missing from his resume. Well, what he has to show you, he has to get behind center in a national football league game in a national football league game. You know, what you really want to go to on a particular play may not be there. You've got to, he's got to show, but the only way you're going to do that, he's got to show you he can do that. The only way you're going to find that out is when he actually takes the snap for you in, in big time NFL games. Here's the, here's what people, and even, even these scouts kind of drive me nuts a little bit because they don't really uh, understand this like they should, or at least, or at least the people who are writing the stories about it, they don't understand it like they should. They don't understand big time major college football. Big time major college football is you've got these fairly brilliant, in my opinion, offensive coordinators on a lot of these teams with great talent, usually better talent than the team they're facing. I'm talking about on the elite teams, 90% of the time. And they draw up plays to get one, one player in particular wide open on a particular play. And usually about 90% of the time, that's exactly what happens, you know? And so, yeah. You know, for the most part, Justin Fields is not going through a progression. Uh, neither was Trevor Lawrence at at, uh, at Clemson. And this year in particular, Mac Jones at Alabama, his first read, as quickly as he was getting rid of the ball, his first read, not even, it wasn't even really a read. It was catch it, throw it to that, that guy. That's what, that's what his read was, you know. It was more like recite than it was read. And uh, <laughs> now you're going into a situation – like a Tom Brady, where Tom Brady is invaluable, is finding that second or third receiver or dumping it off, checking down, taking five yards uh, instead of like getting uh, becoming gluttonous and trying to get 15 on a play where the play's not there. That's, that's what happens to a, re, a quarterback when he matures. Uh, but also, that's part and parcel of staying in the NFL is the ability to then start making those reads. But this suddenly eye opening revelation that Justin Fields necessarily didn't get to his second, third, or fourth reads on plays uh, usually or didn't look off the safeties. And I'm not sure that's as accurate as they're putting it out there. But anyway, I, that's no big surprise to me or you who cover college football and know what it's all about, right? Yeah, and that's – I mean, look, was Justin Herbert uh, doing that a lot before he became the rookie of the year? Uh, that's the no. way – it's the difference between college football and the NFL and the way that the NFL game needs Mom, is – Hi, sweetie. Uh, Hi, Liberty. <laughs> Daddy. I need you to – I need you to – Hey. Oh, can I take my water? Sure, one second. Okay. Um, that's the way that <laughs> – She needs uh, to hydrate, man. She needs yeah, to hydrate. That's right. It's a Mickey Mirati uh, philosophy in here. I wish I had my grandson right here. He'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> they, Go ahead, they could, Yeah, they, they, should, they should be on the show and having a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. About Disney and Pixar. Um, hey, that's an idea. Yeah, go ahead. That'll be, yeah. 
that'll be the Friday show. Um, that's the diff- That's the evolution of the college game bleeding into the NFL. Is that uh, these guys are, are Patrick Mahomes, even Baker Mayfield, yeah. coming out of those systems. You're not asking these guys to do NFL level three, four reads. Like the game is different, and uh, you're seeing more of that go to the next level. And my and I think that if you asked Justin Fields, every time we've dealt with that guy, everything we've ever heard. That's what Ohio State wanted him to do. Like he could do that, but he's also, you know, you don't want to complicate needlessly for your entire offense or your quarterback, especially if you have the athleticism to um, extend plays and do things with your feet that set you apart. Like exactly, it's got all those tools. They check every box, and not one time did I ever hear uh, Ryan Day or or Corey Dennis or Mike Yersich or Kevin Wilson say, "Well, we really think we'd have something here." if we could just get him to go to four reads or, uh, you know, move his shoulders a little bit better and, and look off of safety. I mean, there are, certain, there are examples of him doing exactly that yes. throughout his career, but that's not something that Ohio State needed him to do on a play-in, play-out basis. And that's not – that's not I, I don't know of any quarterback, even Trevor Lawrence, you brought up that earlier, Tim, that is ever asked to do that. That's just not, not the way of college football. No, it's not. I mean, you know, uh, Trevor Lawrence, for example, I mean, w- one of the things that intrigues me about uh, Clemson's offense is it, it does look like they have a, the one, what I call the, I call it the one read high where, man, if they give you that bomb, if they give you that takeoff, you know, we'll always look for that, man. If you can get that, but that, you know, it goes like the, back to Bill Walsh and things like that, just little tenets of football. If they give it to you, if they bring the safety flying up, throw the deep ball, you know what I mean? That's, that's, I don't know how much of a read that is. Just a, that's more of a read and react, you know, more of a reaction kind of thing. Ohio State had that. Ohio State has that. But the bottom line is most of Ohio State's plays designed by Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson, those guys, was designed to get A, B, C, or D wide open. And let's face it, about 90, 90% of the time this past year, that worked. The, the Northwestern game, you're missing your number one receiver in Chris Olave. You're missing basically your number three or four receiver. You know, uh, Jackson Smith and, and Jigba, I think, was missing that game. If, I'm trying to remember who all was missing that game. Yeah, things were discombobulated in the passing game. But at Ohio State, as big-time programs do, had a over-the-top running game they finally discovered in Trey Sermon and went with it, and it took them places, took them to the college football playoff. So uh, that's the difference between the colleges and the pros. Uh, the raw material that comes in, the raw, just the raw talent, it would be – I think you'd be hard-pressed to pass on a Justin Fields in the draft. Now, here's the caveat. The caveat is most of these teams that are looking for a quarterback early have other problems. So the quarterback is going to have teething pains uh, going into a, a program, a system like that, than he would if he was going to the Green, to the Green Bay Packers or even the Tampa Bay Bucks right now, et cetera. That's the difference. And then back to the Patrick Mahomes example. Patrick Mahomes looks for that first read. Then Patrick Mahomes runs away. Then it, Then it's, you know, it's – it's hully gully. Yeah. He finds somebody wide open and flips it to him underhand, overhand, sideways, you know, yeah. no look. Falling on oh, his back. Baby, that's not what we're talking about, about second, third, and fourth reads. We're talking about scrambling and making something happen. I think Justin Fields has shown a little bit of an example of that. He didn't have to do that a lot, but I think he's shown the ability to maybe do some of that stuff. That's as important in the NFL as anything else, is taking a broken play and turning into a backbreaker. Do- Maybe it's just, maybe it's just me. I don't know. I, I think it's fascinating that Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy and these guys that that they are the ones that are most willing to adapt and do things that are more like the college game. It helps that you have that raw material that you're talking about with with Patrick yes. Mahomes and one of the great you know improvisational and arm strength players that any of us have seen in a long time. But sometimes it's taken like takes four or five guys like him for everyone to realize, you know what, this might just work at this next level if we start utilizing more emotions and, and letting them do things with one or two reads. And if that's not there, take off, do their, do their playmaking ability. Like, there, there aren't a million of those guys around is also the problem, uh, yeah. obviously. Um, but yes. if you've got a, a, someone with Mahomes' skill set or what Baker Mayfield has done, you know, uh, in a smaller sample size and without maybe as much – uh, talent or coaching around him for the early parts of his career 
We know what Justin Fields can do with his athleticism and his arm ability. You build around those guys. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't mean to take anything away from – definitely not from Lawrence. Um, uh, you know, going from BYU or North Dakota State or, or Mac Jones. Like, those guys are fine, fine athletes. I got nothing against them. But Justin Fields is one of the most gifted people that I've ever seen throw a football yeah. on a week-in, week-out basis. Now, I didn't do that at BYU or North Dakota State. That, so, you know, clearly in my mind, I'm, I'm going to lean towards what I've seen. But I'm also yeah. comparing him to Dwayne Haskins or JT Barrett or Joe Burrow, uh, Braxton Miller, you know, other guys that, you know, that we watched in the Big Ten. We know what it takes. We've seen them play in big-time playoff games. You know, I remember I talked about Sam Darnold. You and I talked about him after that game in the Cotton Bowl. Like, he did some incredible things. It's hard for me to believe that the Jets think they could get somebody with better physical tools than what I saw. The throws he made under pressure against Ohio yep. State were incredible. Yep. Um, so, I'm, to me, that's not exclusive to Ohio State. Um, but what I've seen with my own eyes with Justin Fields a lot of times uh, is off the charts. Yeah, and I agree 100%. You know, I could – we could talk about quarterback play for four hours because I, 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 I've studied it forever. I yeah. love it. I mean, I, and I think it is so individual. Just the, like the guys you just named off that played quarterback at Ohio State, they are all different. <laughs> you know, they are all different, but they all won in some way, form, or fashion big time. And, uh, you know, and to, to say cookie cutter, this cookie is not going to fit on this plate is, you know, wrong. I mean, you've got to let them get in there, and you've got to let them, like I've always told quarterbacks, you know, when I've talked to them behind the scenes sometimes and stuff, I said, you know, the key to becoming the starting quarterback, like at Ohio State, is you've got to show the coaches you can do what they want you to do so you can become the starter. Then you can, like, slowly then evolve into what you can do best, you know, what you, what you bring to the table, you know. It's kind of like working as a, as a painter uh, on, a, on an assembly line, a, a car assembly line. You know, that, that paint's got to be exactly the same every time. But once you start and get to where you can get into your little custom uh, design office, then you can like then you can do your thing. You can be creative and do your thing. And few quarterbacks ever get to that realm, you know, of getting to just drive the car the way they want to drive the car. Right. I'm yeah. mixing my metaphors, but I don't care. It's one of those kind of days. <laughs> Speaking of mixing your metaphors, how would you like to be getting those electricity bills that uh, Texans are running into right now because of uh, five days of super cold weather? Crazy, huh? No thanks. I was uh. Glad that uh, my sister, brother-in-law, and their two nieces were able to escape Houston for a couple of days. They've been up with us in Ohio. Vacation home for Texans. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice to have them up here, take care of them for a couple of days. The timing worked out just about perfectly. It's, really, it's, it's wild, man. Like, but they, they were dealing with cold, and they, Texas just can't really prepare for it the way that we can up here. A well-timed yeah. trip. and. Uh, no, I would not like to have seen those bills. You know, they were talking about being able to get like uh, $25 a day back from their cable and internet provider. Like, you know, need, uh, need maybe to maybe do better than that after what happened with some of those rolling blackouts. Oh, my goodness, man. I'm telling you what. I even talked to my brother about his bills down there. He, he and his wife escaped. It may be the wrong term, but they have a, they have a, they're, they live in a high rise condo in west of uh, Houston and then, and then they have a, uh, I, they call it a weekend farm. I'd move there in a heartbeat, uh, just outside LaGrange, home of uh, uh, J.K. Dobbins. But yep. uh, matter of fact, I told you before, he's the guy that turned me on to J.K. Dobbins long before anybody else even mentioned his name. He goes, you got to come see this guy, Tim. He's unbelievable. And, <laughs> uh, and But the bottom line is, I mean, yeah, what they dealt with. But it's really funny because, you know, you go down to Texas in the middle of July, you know, like in Lufkin where I grew up or Austin, God forbid – where it's over 100 degrees every day, and then you contrast that to what they just dealt with for a week, man, you know, I'll take a sunny, balmy Hilliard, Ohio, any day of the week. How about yourself? You know I love it here. I'm not going to complain. I, I don't mind that I will be uh, slipping away a couple days later this week to get in some golf in uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina. Wow. So I'm not opposed to a couple days away uh, from yeah. Ohio this time of year. Um, but, uh, I still, you know, I, th I'm yeah. really glad to live here. I just, that's, you've heard me say it a bunch of times. People, I don't know if everybody believes it when I say it, but I, I always feel like I was meant to live here. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, like the times I visit uh, get places I really like, like Key West, for example, I'm going, you know, I really like visiting here, but if you lived here all the time, it would get really monotonous, you know I mean? From a weather standpoint. <laughs> Give me but some variety, it, baby. Yeah, exactly. But the thing about it is when you live, like, like my daughter's talking about buying a, vac- buying a home on, on the coast, you know, on one of the outer banks or something. And, uh, and I'm always talking her out of it because number one, you have to rent it 50 weeks out of the year to somebody. Uh, but, but number two, I don't ever want to go to the same place on vacation twice if I can help it. But the, but the other thing is living here makes you appreciate those places and vice versa. You know, I mean, uh, where I live. So, uh, I, I moved North, uh, 43, 44 years ago and haven't regretted it at all, except for last week when I was, uh, my snowblower was kind of breaking down. I had to rebuild the carburetor in the middle of all that, but Hey, that's, that's called not doing your, uh, not doing your maintenance, uh, the way you should. Hey, real quick before we go, uh, Austin, is anything developing on Ohio State front that you that you find interesting at the moment that maybe you didn't talk about on your uh, on your regular regular show this week that uh, you know people should keep their eye on this coming spring? You know, you and I talked before the show started here, and I told you I thought one of the great one of the great returning players on this team who opted not to go pro, for example, that is going to give this some leadership in exactly the right spot is Haskell Garrett. Yeah, and uh, you know you, you kind of like over look some guys, you know, when you're looking toward the future, but does anything pop in your mind? Yeah, right now, um, it's always fascinating to watch. Sometimes sometimes this means something, sometimes it doesn't. The players that, that get highlighted, whether that's social media or, or coaching staff, maybe people that reach out and talk about what's happening, who are, who are these guys that they're seeing, like, turn the corner during winter workouts, during any drills that they do? And this year is different. I get that. It's uh, – yeah. It's not normal, um, and so that might make it more random. But we heard a lot of things from like Al Washington and linebackers last last fall about Tommy Eichenberg, how much they liked his development, how he could become a guy, and then boom, lo and behold, uh, watched Tommy Eichenberg becoming a leader in some social media posts. Case yeah. over. Another person that especially Berm has talked about a lot. He's been driving that Kate Stover bandwagon the same way uh, you and I do for Josh Proctor. Um, and then a couple days later, you see him highlighted, you know, giving a speech during a winter workout. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that those guys have to be the de facto leaders of this coming year because you have Jeremy Rucker or you might have, you know, Taraja Mitchell. Linebacker might be a little bit more open, um, but that's that next wave of players where uh, I'll never forget before the 2014 season, everybody, you know, talking about, uh, the vacant spot at linebacker, who's going to fill it. Uh, Trey Johnson was the name that many of us expected to see out there. Yeah. And first day of practice, Darren Lee, outside linebacker, earned it in winter workouts, earned the trust of the coaching staff. Mickey Marotti saying how hard this guy worked. Um, you know, a little bit. Of, now, I don't know when the first day of spring practice will be. I have a hunch that we won't be watching it to see one of those <laughs> surprises. But that's the kind of thing that, that these, work, these winter workouts really matter to Ohio State. I'm not saying they don't to other people, but they use it to determine opportunities. And there's a lot of it at linebacker. There's, there's a good amount of it at tight end. You know you're going to have leadership from Thayer Munford and Nicholas petit Frere and Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. That's, that's, a, that's just a commonplace accepted baseline. But you're looking for some other guys to play key roles or maybe find their voice. And then you – so we're sorting through some of those, those clues with a mix of reporting and – Old school reporting and new school reporting yeah. on social media. That's, that's kind of been, you know, the way it goes right now. February is a weird time uh, on this beat, but that's, uh, that's sort of been I'm, – I'm, I'm always anxiously awaiting, all right, what's, what's the next piece of insight that we might be able to glean? Yeah, I agree. You know, and like, like you know, what are they going to do, for example, with Paris Johnson Jr., who was mm-hmm. definitely making strides last year, played some too. Uh, Juan Jones. I mean, you know, what, what's going to happen? These are guys that look ready or champing at the bit that if you would say are tackles, but are they going to be tackles in the fall? I mean, they're going to take their best five, their best four plus a center, you know, which will be their best five, yeah. uh, and turn them into something. I'm, I'm as intrigued by just how the offensive line is going to be made up as anything else here. And uh, like you said about Darren Lee, I mean, he's from New Albany. I, I, you know, they didn't – who did they play? You know, when he would come up, he was a he was a, a Swiss Army knife uh, for for one of another term to to bother to uh, borrow a Josh Proctor term. And uh, <laughs> boom, all of a sudden, you know, that's what I was talking about. Boom, all of a sudden in the spring he blossomed. That's what I'm talking about about 
pro, the pros when they draft a quarterback. You don't really know what you're getting until he gets in that huddle. Does he lead? You know, does he get you out of trouble? Does he move the chains? Does he score touchdowns? Does he take the team down the field? Does he rally the troops when, th when things are getting tough, et cetera? You don't know really and truly until you, until you get him under center and let him play a little bit. Same thing with a pro football head coach. I'm not trying to do a, a, a wrap up here, but we are put, trying to start to put the flaps down and getting ready to come in for a landing. I'm letting you gonna, I'm gonna let you make this landing, but uh, but you don't know about that until you know, until the until it's real. Yep. And, and that's and that's why, like we've I've said it over and over. I mean, that's Justin Fields has been behind the wheel of a jetliner, you know, of, of, as mechanically sound and and. Yeah, all the bells and whistles. You can help me out. I mean, he's had to fly a plane that is expected to be the best plane in in America two years in a row, and yeah. he did it without any real, real hiccups. And if you're gonna grade him on, you know, the Northwestern game and not factor in everything that was missing, or you know, the f uh, couple interceptions against Clemson last year when it was, you know, a high pressure game, still had them in position to win it. Uh, other factors that take that like you know that's fine anybody can do that but I've seen Justin Fields land that plane uh in difficult circumstances easy circumstances everything yeah and I've never once come away thinking that that guy was not an NFL quarterback well ladies and gentlemen if nothing else on the Tim May podcast we stick to our analogies we stick to them tight and I appreciate awesome Ward my co-pilot for uh bringing this plane in for a uh, another <clears throat> you know Smooth landings are overrated. Any landing you walk away from, as pilots know, is a good landing, you know, and, yes. uh, and as long as the plane is still sitting upright, let's put it that way. <laughs> <clears throat> but the cost of aviation, you don't want to get there. You don't want to go there. But uh, you know what? Awesome. Thanks for coming on the Tim May podcast again, my man. I appreciate it. And I really want to uh, thank uh, Paul Feinbaum for coming on again. I, I enjoy having him on because, you know, he, he doesn't mind speaking his mind. And, you know, I'm sure some of the things he said might have rankled some Ohio State fans. And some of the things he said might have made them feel pretty good about themselves. Uh, that's the beauty of Paul Feinbaum, right? That's him in a nutshell. All right. But you know what? Until next week, this is Tim May uh, for Awesome Ward. Uh, this is Tim May Podcast. We'll see you next week.